With me is Bruce Wampold. He is a very influential psychotherapy researcher and professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research on the efficacy of psychotherapy and its underlying mechanisms of change have made a significant impact in the field. And his recent book, The Great Psychotherapy Debate, now in its second edition, reviews the research evidence for what works in psychotherapy. So I'm very pleased to have you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. Well, I'd like to start off a little bit with you. And I'd like to ask you, how did your background in mathematics influence you as a psychotherapy researcher? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Uh, I was just telling a class I'm teaching that I never took a psychology course as an undergraduate. <laughs> so uh, um, I was a math and science major, and that was my interest, and I was a little intimidated by psychology. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. It was the 1970s, and a lot of anti-war protests and things were in, in turmoil um, in many ways. So I decided I'd become a high school teacher oh. um, uh, for a few years to figure out what I wanted to do. So I was a, a high school mathematics teacher and wrestling coach at Punahou School in Honolulu. Great. And the most famous student at the school when I was there was Barack Obama. Oh, so, really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't take any credit for him. But during that time, I got interested in in – um, the students, mm -hmm. um, because I had a wide range of students. We had, you know, kind of the richest, uh, um, uh, we call them Howley kids, the, the white kids from uh, Honolulu, as well as um, Native Hawaiians and Samoans and uh, Japanese Americans and, and Chinese Americans and so forth. It was a very diverse uh, group, and I watched the students, some of whom succeeded uh, overcome many barriers and had this resilience mm -hmm. and others had every opportunity and couldn't thrive. So I got interested in psychology through uh, just my curiosity about mm -hmm. these kids. So I went back and uh, became interested both in psychotherapy and psychotherapy research. Yeah, it's something interesting that comes up also in that answer is that it seems to link well with your interest in multicultural issues in psychotherapy. So immediately it, there. Yeah. yeah, it does. It uh -huh. does. And, you know, well, psychotherapy has always, for me, been a way to um, give uh, life uh, or greater satisfaction or better functioning to people who don't have it. Mm -hmm. And often it's people who have faced barriers, and we know that various cultural groups, particularly in the United States, have significant barriers um, to, uh, um, well, to many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it only makes sense. I can't imagine somebody interested in psychotherapy who's not also interested in, in multicultural because uh, they really belong together. Yeah. It, is, it is the essence of what we do. Yeah, and when you went into this uh, focused interest in psychology and psychotherapy specifically, was there any offer or book that really like enamored you with the field? Well, um, uh, Jerome Frank's Persuasion and Healing. Uh, you know, I go back and I read it periodically. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's just a fascinating, prescient, uh, uh, small book. And you know what's interesting is that, that he was trained as a psychiatrist in the medical model. Yeah. He believed... It, that some treatments were going to be superior to others and there were mechanisms of change uh -huh. involved in particular treatments. And he changed his mind based on the research evidence. So it's more than just he wrote great stuff. Uh -huh. his, his own attitude towards research evidence yeah. and how it should be used is quite inspiring. The other thing that, that really was influential in my development was um, the following. So I entered graduate school, PhD program in 1977. And, you know, during the decade preceding that, uh, Hans Eysenck's 
uh, um, criticism of psychotherapy mm-hmm. was pretty much accepted. You know, psychotherapy is bogus. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no better than spontaneous remission. Mm-hmm. So when I was in my first semester as a graduate student, Jean Glasses and Mary Lee Smith's meta-analysis uh-huh. on psychotherapy effectiveness came out. And that's another article I go back and read Mm -hmm. because it's absolutely brilliant. It's brilliant methodologically. It's brilliant in its creativity and its curiosity. And so that uh, also, um, you know, gave me hope this stuff really works. (laughs) And, you uh, you know, I should talk about this just briefly. But psychotherapy for me and my own personal development has been very important. Mm-hmm. So it's not just an academic interest entirely um, uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, I found psychotherapy extremely useful in my own life. Yeah. So it's, it's a passion on a number of different levels. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So on the emotional, personal, and the academic research side. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So you would still recommend to go back and read Persuasion and Healing and the old meta-analysis by... Well, it, it, it is really important um, for people to go back and read uh, not just the classics, yeah. but more obscure things. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the history is important, um, both in terms of how we've progressed, but also in terms of what we've ignored you know, I talk some about this in the first chapter in the new edition of the Great Psychotherapy Debate, but but we've left out the, you know, it, in the United States, the incorporation of psychotherapy in the healthcare delivery system has been wonderful, yeah. okay? Let's not diminish that because psychologists get paid often through through managed care or uh, Medicare, Medicaid, through insurance. Um, but And not only do they get paid, but it's given uh, uh, access mm-hmm. for many people yeah. to have psychotherapy. I mean, it was for the fairly well-off, mm-hmm. you know, in Freud's time, <laughs> if you want to pay for psychoanalysis, uh, that that was costly, and, and usually you paid out of pocket. Yeah. Uh, for that, uh, so access has been increased, but the the um, yeah. kind of incorporation or assimilation into the medical model has um, we've sacrificed because of it. We mm-hmm. we've given up some important things, and I I think we need to go back and and really pay attention to. To what we've left out. Yeah, well, bringing what you're talking together, there was this bitter pill that a lot of people still have a hard time swallowing, and that you've written a lot about, which ties within with the common factors approach and the contextual model that you present. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you. It's called sometimes the dodo bird verdict. I, I have to yeah. ask you about it. Like all psychotherapists, at least for particular disorders, seem to have no differences in in outcomes. Well. I- Yes, I, I, that's true, but we really have to be careful mm-hmm. about how we state it. Yeah. So it, it's, it's not any particular treatment is effective. Mm-hmm. It has to first be given by a skilled therapist mm-hmm. uh, who believes in the treatment mm-hmm. and to a patient who also believes that this treatment is um, a, a viable means to overcome they're difficulties. Yeah. Okay, so the therapist is really, really important. And we know about therapist effects, and we know that there are some great CBT therapists. When I say great, I mean effective, yeah. can actually help patients. There's some great dynamic therapists, there's great humanistic therapists, and so forth. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but there are also some very, how should I say it? Lousy. Very, <laughs> not efficient. <laughs> yeah, not efficient. So, you know, we've looked at data. There's some therapists who who really struggle to help any of their patients, yeah. and that's something that should be concerning. So that's that's one one qualification on the dodo bird. Yeah. The second is, and and this is something that I have come to realize more and more. So treatments with a structure seem to be 
more effective mm-hmm. than just open-ended uh, um, talk therapy without any structure for how the patient is going to overcome their difficulties. And actually, if you go back and you read Jerome Frank, uh-huh. um, he talks about this. So you have to explain to the patient how what we're going to do in therapy yeah. is going to be helpful for overcoming these particular problems. I believe it was the so, myth. Right. <laughs> so there needs to be a rationale yeah. or a myth yeah. and a, a ritual. Uh-huh. So something something that the patient does. Um, and I'm very clear now about that in my writing, that just meeting with an empathic therapist, yeah. don't get me wrong, the evidence is pretty strong that that's helpful, mm-hmm. okay? But for the particular difficulties, we need some actions. We need to have the patients do something, uh-huh, uh-huh. enact something uh-huh. that makes sense and will help promote them to do something that's helpful in their lives. Yeah, yeah. You know, we do it in very different ways, but but dynamic therapist, um, uh, um, uh, CBT therapist, uh, motion focused therapist, and even humanistic therapists mm-hmm. are pretty clear that that the patient. You have to do something to help yourself overcome these difficulties. Now, what we do, they're pretty varied, right? <laughs> CBT therapist is going to do something completely different. Well, completely different, very different than a CBT therapist. Mm-hmm. They have commonalities. Yeah. But the com- one of the important common features is we get the, th- the patient to do something yeah. that's important in their lives. So they have some agency or some self-efficacy, some mastery. You know, Jerome Frank talked about mastery. Mm -hmm. His discussion of mastery, by the way, I digress Mm -hmm. a little bit, is very similar to how uh, Albert Bandura talked about Mm -hmm. self-efficacy. They're almost identical. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So you can read other theorists. uh, Ernie Kirsch talks about changing response expectancies. Mm -hmm. These are all... Very similar things yeah. with some important distinction. So trying to sum up a little what you're saying, these three pathways you're talking about, so it's important in your model, let's call it, and during the research that you've done, so the, the real relationship, the client's belief in the therapy, and uh, the actions that go with it. That's right, okay. yeah. And, you know, some therapies emphasize one of those more than another. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important for both uh, uh, treatment, uh, people who develop treatments, Mm -hmm. but also therapists to keep in mind all three pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, CBT really emphasizes the last pathway, but they limit effectiveness if they don't also consider the fact that the human relationship is a really healing Mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know this from, from basic science. Uh, Loneliness is a better predictor of mortality than is obesity, diet, (laughs) exercise. So the human connection for many patients is is amazingly uh, um, healing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, So CBT therapists need to pay attention to that. On the other hand, humanistic therapists put, you know, a lot of eggs into that first pathway, mm-hmm. not realizing these other pathways are important too. Yeah. yeah. So I want well-rounded mm. kind it, it's of therapy. A, it's a different way to espouse an integrative approach. It's maybe not the classical integrativism uh, SEPI members will talk about, but it's trying to bring in these different elements that you find effective. Well, yeah, I, I like the way you frame that because <laughs> it, it, it is an integration. Yeah. Um, maybe not the way integration is. <laughs> every, per, every person in CEPI has a different definition <laughs> of integration is. But it is an integrative model, yeah. you're right. But tell me something. When you read in the research literature that 5 to 9%, I think, of the variance in outcome is due to the therapist himself, what does this mean? Because for people not uh, very familiar with the research, it could seem like a very small number, 5 to 9%. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Uh, when I do workshops or presentations, I have some slides to explain 
uh, how important this is. And I, I use American baseball as an example. Because, <laughs> really? uh, yeah, because the difference between an, uh, a star player uh-huh. in terms of batting average and a mediocre or even a marginal player is not very great. Okay, but it makes a very important difference. So, you know, uh, M- Michael Barkham's research in the National Health Service or research that we've done in managed care, the difference between uh, the top quartile of therapists and the bottom quartile uh, in the long run makes an, uh, um, uh, a significant and important difference in outcomes. Yeah. So, um, and Zach Immel has done a simulation of this. If you if you take the, the patients of the bottom 5% of therapists and mm-hmm. just randomly assign them to other, patient, other therapists, the, the number of recoveries, additional recoveries, yeah. Yeah. is amazing. <laughs> so a small difference over the long run yeah. is important. So um, I hope your next question is, well, what does that mean for policy? Are we supposed to get rid of, of uh, <laughs> the, the bottom 5% of therapists? What should we do? Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, my career now, and I'm getting towards the end of it, is, is devoted to how do we help therapists mm-hmm. become more effective? Yeah. Uh, we just did a study. Um, the therapists do not improve over the course of their careers. Mm-hmm. Some do, but on average, they don't. In fact, they get a little bit worse. Mm-hmm. We have to do something about that. Mm-hmm. And I think well, we know what to do. We need to do continual improvement. People need to practice their therapy skills over the lifetime. Yeah. Deliberate practice. So, yep, yeah. yeah. So, Some form of deliberate practice. Yeah. So, so let's sort of jump right into that. Of course, I would like to ask you about that. So knowing that probably therapists, this is, bas- by the way, this is a very scary thought also, the bitter pill to swallow, another one. The idea that someone could spend their life in training and supervision and going to seminars and their outcomes don't get better. So this well, is- I, I don't think it's a bitter pill at all. I think it's pretty understandable. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, psychotherapy is a very unusual profession. Okay, what other profession is so isolated and secretive, right? We go into a room with a patient. What's done there is confidential. Nobody really knows, okay? We don't get any feedback really about uh, uh, outcomes or or our technique. You know, surgeons, they know whether they have goofed because (laughs) uh, the blood vessel ruptures or something. Okay, lawyers do their work in court or it's examined. It's really hard in psychotherapy to get better. So I don't think it's, you know, the fault of psychotherapists or the fault of the profession. It's Mm -hmm. just structurally a very difficult thing to do. So we really need to build in ways to not just get supervision through uh, um, our lifetime career of practice, Mm -hmm. but actual build in opportunities to practice particular skills. We know musicians uh, practice, 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 Mm -hmm. right? They asked Pablo Casals, the famous Mm -hmm. uh, cellist, He's in his 80s, right? Why do you practice four or five hours a day? You're the best in the world. And you know what he said? Yes, he feels he's still getting better. That's right. That's <laughs> exactly right. So, and it's practice outside of performance. Yeah. Okay, so we do psychotherapy six hours a day. Yeah. That doesn't count. You need to really have focused practice yeah. with feedback and a coach outside of practice. But, but but you're right. This is this is a change, a big yeah. change yeah. in uh, uh, the way we do business. <laughs> so, and it's hard to ask therapists to do this. They're busy. Um, this is not work that's going to be compensated or mm-hmm. paid for. Mm-hmm. Although I think employers and payers should insist that people do this. In the United States, we have continuing education. Many other places do this. You know, you go to a seminar and you sit there. Oh, it's kind (laughs) of interesting. Maybe it's boring. Oh, I could use a little of that. Why, instead of sitting 
for eight hours mm-hmm. uh, listening to somebody that talk about something. Uh-huh. We can't spend that eight hours practicing yeah. with feedback. Yeah. It would be much better spent. Yeah. Uh, before jumping to the routine outcome monitoring, the feedback, I'd like just to make a bridge there. Could you tell us a little bit about, um, well, they have been called the super shrinks sometimes, but just to talk in general about let's talk the top performers or what do you think are the most efficient therapists, what do you think are the defining qualities of these people? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I don't like the term super shrinks. Okay. okay? Uh-huh. It, it, you know, the distribution of outcomes of patients is pretty well normally distributed. There are some people who are clearly more effective than others, mm-hmm. but but maybe they're all stars or super shrinks or something. <laughs> but but it, it it we can all get better. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I don't like to think of well. There Someone, are these people exactly. way out here, <laughs> On the and if we're, we're not there, then we're nothing. <laughs> I, I, I really don't like that. But we, we are starting to identify what are the characteristics and actions of effective therapists. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'll just go through them quickly. And, yes. and this is due to some studies on the alliance, some of which I've involved in. Some of the work is is um, uh, from Tim Anderson and his facilitative interpersonal skills. And there's other research coming out that seems to validate this. But the more effective therapists are able to form a, a strong collaborative working alliance with a range of patients. So even with the with a difficult, uh, personally, interpersonally aggressive, challenging, maybe borderline features. Now, we know we're not going to have a strong alliance or as strong alliances with other patients, but the good therapists, effective therapists, can form at least a decent working alliance with those difficult patients. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the inter- f- facilitative interpersonal skills, again, uh, uh, shows up most conspicuously with the challenging patients, but uh, verbally fluent, so uh, more effective therapists are able to verbalize succinctly and articulately what they want to say in a very precise way. Uh-huh. So if you listen to good therapists, they, they're doing interpretations or they're explaining a cognitive therapy or whatever they're doing. It's clear. clear. It's understandable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good therapists um, are able to, to read uh, the affective state of their patients, mm-hmm. even if the patient's trying to hide it or, or, or cover it up in some way. So I got some great video clips of therapists who who recognize sadness mm-hmm. in a patient, even though the patient's smiling and joking. Uh-huh. So they can tell this is they're covering up uh, or avoiding the sadness, and they understand this. Good therapists are able to modulate their own affective reaction. Okay, sometimes you want to activate the patient and and show uh, um, activation and 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 strong emotion. Other times, therapists have to cover up their affective reaction to a patient. Yeah. Okay. I've had a student who worked with a uh, uh, a patient who didn't bathe. It was disgusting, uh-huh. and we had to work on how do you cover up That's your tough. disgust. Yeah. Because you won't, don't want to communicate to the patient that you're disgusted. Yeah. Uh, patients with anxiety disorders, um, particularly you know, ones that might have a panic attack in a session. Um, I had a again a, a one of my trainees whose patient actually vomited in a session mm-hmm. because they were so anxious. Mm-hmm. So you have to show calmness, even though you're anxious. Yes. You know, what's going to happen in this session with this highly volatile mm-hmm. patient? Mm-hmm. Well, Those I'm are. Calm. <laughs> yeah. So affective modulation. Uh, you know, some of these are not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all make sense. Yeah. Warmth, mm-hmm. empathy, understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, mm-hmm. and communicating that to the patient. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, one that, that seems... Like it's obvious, but but 
is a struggle for some patients is focus on the th- on the patient rather than on oneself. Uh-huh. Okay, so we talk about interjections or or uh, um, letting countertransference, letting our own issues mm-hmm. intrude, and and that's something you know that that really effective therapists is a a, a laser focus on the patient and their difficulties and how we're going to overcome those difficulties. Mm -hmm. So you're communicating all the time that uh, we're here to help you get better. Mm -hmm. But good therapists, when progress is made, uh, the patient will and the therapist will help them uh, attribute that to their hard work. Mm -hmm. So uh, when a patient says, you know, I want to really thank you, what you've done for me, uh-huh. really helpful, the good therapist will turn that around and say, well, do you recognize all the hard work you have done? Yes. And that's what made this therapy successful. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, 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 so we, we, and these are skills, you know, that, that, CBT therapists use, dynamic therapists use, humanistic therapists use, uh-huh. family therapists use. These are, I guess, common factors. <laughs> but they're, they're done in, in slightly different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the way a CBT therapist might show understanding and concern could be different than a dynamic therapist. So mm-hmm. um, there's some subtleties how you want to adapt these common factors to your particular therapy orientation. Yeah. And all the things you're saying, they're all trainable. Yes. Yeah. They're, and we need to practice them. Yeah. Okay. So this is where the deliberate practice comes in. So we can focus yeah. on what's not happening in the session and work on that. Yeah. And we know this from learning any skill. Yeah. So I'm a sailor, and when I learned how to sail, uh-huh. and even now, you have to practice over and over again uh-huh. various maneuvers. So, and so uh, when you go out and sail for recreation, you usually don't practice any of these things. Mm-hmm. And this is why I like to do some racing and sailing, because you have to practice the particular maneuvers and you do them over and over and over again uh-huh. and that's how you get better and you also done research and there there's also research of our biases in a way that we don't really know how well uh the therapy is the the alliances and a lot of things cannot come to conscience even for the therapist sometimes this is where i think the feedback comes in the even the outcome monitoring so yes I, i'd like to ask you so let, let me let me play devil's advocate here. Okay. Do, <laughs> do you and think, you know, I like that. So Great, great. So do you think the uh, an outcome measure, like the OQ45, do you think it's enough for us to know that we're doing good therapy? It, it, and, and the literature seeming to, to show this. Um, uh, it looks like when... Uh, uh, routine outcome monitoring, like the OQ or or Scott Miller's ORS, and there's, as you know, several others. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when it's helpful, it's helpful for particular patients. Okay, so this particular patient is not getting better. That's useful informa- information for the therapist. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. and then the therapist does something differently with that patient. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, in my mind, the important thing is let's discuss your progress. You're not making progress and I'm here, remember the focus on the other, yeah. I'm here to help you and so if you're not making progress, we have to think about what to do differently. Yeah. So, But it doesn't look like that kind of feedback helps therapists become better therapists and in fact, the study I mentioned about therapists over their careers not getting better, Mm -hmm. that was in a center where they had access to Uh the OQ. So just getting that information, because it's not really actionable information. What should I do differently? Is it my work with the alliance? Do I need to work on verbal fluency? Is it the fact that that, um, I get irritated by difficult patients? And it, my, my empathic responding um, 
uh, is is uh, interfered with. Mm-hmm. So we need more specific feedback if we're actually going to use the feedback mm-hmm. to become better therapists. So feedback, I think, is really important. I think the the outcome monitoring. Um, both for particular clients and to know how we're doing in general. Yeah. You know, in general, if we're not helping most of our patients, yeah. then that's motivation to get better. Uh-huh, okay. uh-huh. Um, so, but it's limited. It, it really is limited in what it tells us about what we're doing as a therapist. And what about taping of sessions, be it video or audio? How do you think about the possibilities of that for feedback? Well, I think that's really good if we use a coach to help us. Okay. okay? Uh-huh. Again, it's really hard to identify. It's not just therapists. It's it's just the professionals. Human, yeah, yeah, professionals or people, students in classrooms and things. It's hard to 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 really know how we're progressing yeah. without somebody who's a who's a really effective coach mm-hmm. okay so when i say that uh, i say it because you know just because you're the most def- super shrink you're a really effective therapist doesn't mean you're going to be an effective supervisor mm-hmm. okay it's a it's a related but different skill yeah so to get better we 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 need to go through our tapes with with somebody who's there to help us improve, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. and and I'm actually working on some ways to do this. Uh, I'm working with some uh, um, kind of tech people to develop electronic means mm-hmm. so that uh, therapists can get together and be coaches for each other, like an online uh, uh, system. Yeah. And uh, so, because it's really hard for therapists to meet with other therapists because sure. we're at a distance, <laughs> and so we're trying to get therapists who are are similar, working with similar kinds of patients, using similar yeah. treatment strategies, yeah. and so forth, to get together and go through tapes and yeah. support each other and practice skills. Yeah. By the way, yeah. do you believe in therapist self-report as something? Uh, that could be very valuable, or would you like to focus mainly on the, the tapes and the audio, which is more concrete? Yeah, self-report's hard. It's really hard to um, <laughs> talk about what we did in a session, yeah. and particularly those things that were were um, concerned about. So, and it looks like in supervision that that there's agreement you really need the actual uh therapy interaction mm-hmm. to be most effective in the supervision yeah. so it's not always possible and then of course we have to do it from therapist report yeah. but yeah by the way so you we talked about it came out the second edition of your book the psychotherapy debate the great psychotherapy yes. debate yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a big one and it, it's a wonderful book and i'd like to ask you between the first edition which is 2001 i believe and this one if you had to choose one innovation that came between those two editions what do you think it would be innovation in psychotherapy research well, yeah. I, yeah well let me talk about a, a couple different things. No, I know uh, you only asked for one. No, go ahead. <laughs> so it, in, in terms of, of practice, the, the routine outcome monitoring mm-hmm. is one big innovation. It, you know, it, it looks like the, the actual effect maybe is not as large as we thought it was. There's a new Cochrane review that 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 – it is pretty um, clear that the effect is smaller than we we had previously thought. But what it's done is, so importantly, is to focus our attention on outcomes. Yeah. The, the goal is to help patients. Mm-hmm. And this idea of measuring outcomes has really influenced how – most of the field now thinks about psychotherapy. Yeah. So when we talk about effective therapists, we're not talking about those that have a good reputation or are nominated by others or, or are, give workshops. 
a expert therapist is one who achieves admirable or commendable outcomes mm -hmm. with most of his or her patients. So the focus on outcomes is, is a big development since 2001. Yeah. In terms of understanding um, uh, psychotherapy, mm -hmm. the big development, I think, is the frequent measurement of outcomes and process. Okay. The longitudinal over the course of therapy and the multi-level models where we disaggregate what what's uh, within patient variability, between patient variability, uh, within therapists, between therapists. We're starting to understand. Yeah. Right. We're understanding mm -hmm. now to a greater extent how psychotherapy unfolds over time, what causes something to happen in kind of the course of therapy. So uh, the, the alliance is, is stronger uh, than it usually is for this particular patient, what happens to symptom levels yeah. in the following week. Yeah. So we can really kind of start to track this in. It's not real time, but it's as close to real time as we're going to get in, in therapy. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I started my career l looking at um, utterance by utterance mm -hmm. uh, um, in a particular session. And so that's probably the next place we're going to go. Okay. And some people are looking at, at utterance by utterance at machine level learning. Cause, so can you track fluctuations in empathy uh -huh. due to semantic structures within sessions? So we're on the verge of um, finding out about psychotherapy in ways that, that we haven't before. You know, I, I mentioned this at, at a session at uh, SPR, but uh, I think in 10 years, 95% of what we know about psychotherapy will be new. Really? Yeah. You, you think we're that close to greater innovations? I, I think so. Wow. Uh, we got great methods coming online <laughs> and great researchers coming online, uh -huh. and it's my hope. I think we, we just scratched the surface of real understanding about how yeah, yeah. people change. Uh, uh, so, uh -huh. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I'm optimistic that we're going to know much more yeah, than we know. And you're not just focused on outcome research. You're talking about being able to do process outcome research to actually know what's working. We have to do... We, there is no outcome research <laughs> by itself <laughs> by itself and there's no process research the uh -huh. the goal is to is to link what we do in therapy uh -huh. and we being the therapist and the patient uh -huh. because the, both people are working here uh -huh. and how that leads to change uh -huh. which is outcome uh -huh. so uh the distinction between process and outcome research will disappear. Yeah. So hopefully in five <laughs> years, people won't say, won't I'm a process that. researcher, I'm an outcome researcher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, In your own practice, do you find yourself being um, more influenced or do you find yourself uh, gravitating towards any kind of case conceptualization from any model? Do you tend yeah. to do that? Well, I don't do practice anymore because uh -huh. I just don't have the time given my, my other commitments, yeah. but I'm still active uh, in training therapists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me personally, uh, I like to conceptualize uh, cases from a psychodynamic perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to think about problems systemically. Mm -hmm. So when you get the, the kind of systemic uh, conceptualizations or, or way of working from family therapy, I think is important, although the system for me is much more than just the family. It's yeah. also the culture, the society, um, uh, so kind of the, the rings, you know, Bronfenbrenner's uh, <laughs> ecological model. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm pretty pragmatic in interventions. Mm -hmm. So I like to, to really think about interventions as matching uh, uh, the folk psychology of the patient how does the patient think about his or her difficulties yeah. and what's the cultural 
uh, um, way of of conceptualizing uh, mental distress. Yeah. Uh, and then because some clients who are very pragmatic and concrete may respond much better to a cognitive behavioral therapy, whereas others um, need more affect-focused psychodynamic work. So I'm comfortable working in a variety of different ways. Yeah. And Jerome Frank said this, therapists need to learn several different treatment modalities to find the one that fits, uh, uh, fits with yeah. the patient. So it, it's in persuasion and healing. <laughs> Again. So I, I try to, to operate pretty pragmatically, yeah. but also always thinking of the humanistic stance that this is somebody who is in extreme amount of distress meeting with another human being and I have to meet with them as as a caring person. Mm -hmm. You know, psychotherapy is pretty amazing. What's our contract? No matter what the patient says, how distressing it is, how shameful it is, with some exceptions, we're going to be there again for them next week. Not just present, but empathically present. Yeah. What a great gift that is. Uh -huh. You know, there's no other relationship we have like that. Uh -huh. So there's that humanistic aspect that I think we always have to keep in mind when we meet with patients. I believe you called it also a common factor in a way, the humanistic element of yep. psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I, I'd like to... And, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I... I was going to repeat myself just because I want to emphasize things, but I think I said it. I, no, no. I, <laughs> well, what I was going to say is that I, I think CBT therapists, I, I'm going to use the extremes here, mm -hmm. have to keep that humanistic thing Alive. Uh, in mind because naturally that's something they don't think about. Yeah. On the other hand, the humanistic therapists have to keep the, the pragmatic part we have to ha help the patient do something yeah. to get better. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's as as therapists, we always have to keep multiple things in mind, uh -huh. and we have a tendency to kind of gravitate towards what we do mm -hmm. well and what we feel comfortable with. Uh, but remember, it's the things that doesn't come easy or we don't feel comfortable with mm -hmm. that we have to work on. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so so I, I'd like to finish off with a question that I've asked all of your colleagues in these interviews, which is, uh, what advice would you wish to have gotten when you were starting out as a psychotherapist? That's a great question. Um, well, it's easy to think about, well, you know, we got to keep an open mind, we got to be willing to change and so forth. But um, uh, I think what I didn't realize is what a, a effort it takes to remain um, curious and learning, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and this applies to my work as a therapist and supervisor, but also to my work as a as a researcher, yeah. you can never uh, just say, I know enough to do good research. Mm -hmm. New things are coming online, new methods, new understanding, um, developments in neuroscience and placebo studies and anthropology. It, it, just the realization that you get your PhD or you're certified as a therapist and, and, every, <laughs> and then you've made it. I've made it. I, I passed my last exam. So I passed the exam to be a diplomat in professional psychology. Uh, 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 I've done it. Okay, I'm board certified. No, it's just the first step uh, in a continual process. Yeah. And, and that's a a challenging and formidable, but I wish someone had said that it's also what makes it exciting. Yeah. You know, it's kind of boring just to quit yeah. and be good but not great at something. Mm -hmm. So, Bruce, thank you so much. So I guess like 
Pablo Casals, I said, I'm going to keep practicing. Exactly. You're still getting better. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Bruce, thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, thank you. It's been a great <laughs> conversation.